Uh, today we have Mark Nicholas Sommer, who is a postdoc researcher at the University of Basel, and his research areas include German idealism and critical theory. Uh, his talk today is entitled Enjoy Thyself, the Architectonics of Hegel's System. Mark, please. Okay, thank you, Hi, Leas, and thank you to the organizers for putting together this lecture series on this demandic but also vital topic. My talk aims to elucidate the architectonics of Hegel's system as it is set forth in the syllogisms of the system. As you well know, only the first and the third edition, but not the second, contain three syllogisms with which Hegel closes his presentation of the so-called philosophical sciences, that is logic, philosophy of nature and philosophy of spirit. Now, I won't ruminate on the possible reasons Hegel might have had for omitting the three final syllogisms from the 1827 encyclopedia, because this would be mere guesswork on my part. I will base my reading mainly on the third edition from 1830, but I will also use the formulations of the first edition of 1817 when I think that they are clearer than the later counterpart. In addition, I will refer to Hegel's handwritten notes on absolute spirit, which contain some valuable clues. Since the text in question is a notoriously difficult one, there are almost as many readings as they are, there are interpreters. While I won't engage with competing readings, it might be useful by way of introduction to contrast my reading with an approach that seems promising because Hegel's text suggests it. This approach reads the syllogisms of the system as corresponding to the distinct types of syllogisms that Hegel discusses in the science of logic and thus approaches them via a reading of the different types of syllogisms expounded in the science of logic. By contrast, I suggest reading the syllogisms of the system in the context of that part of the system that contains them, the philosophy of spirit. While the syllogisms of the system obviously deal with the whole of the system, they belong to the section called absolute spirit, and I suggest that we approach them by way of Hegel's idea of a philosophy of spirit. By reconstructing the demands that Hegel places on the philosophy of spirit, we should be able to formulate the specific task that the syllogisms of the system are supposed to complete, and then we may read the text of the syllogisms of the system in light of this task. This means that I am suggesting a two-step approach. The first step aims to answer two questions. First, what are the demands of self-knowledge self that Hegel formulates in his philosophy of spirit? And second, why is this self-knowledge articulated in a syllogistic structure? The second step brings the results of the first step to bear on the syllogisms of, of, the, of the system in a close reading of the four last paragraphs of the encyclopedia. The demands of self-knowledge. Hegel introduces his philosophy of spirit with a reference to the first of the Delphic maxims, know thyself. He interprets the self-knowledge commanded by this maxim not as an individual's knowledge of her particularities, but as knowledge of man's essence as spirit. The topic of the philosophy of, philosophy of spirit is spirit's self-knowledge of itself as spirit. Hegel then proceeds to distinguish his own take on the philosophy of spirit from two competing approaches, rational psychology and empirical psychology. Both are inadequate because neither of them is what Hegel calls a speculative approach. A proper philosophy of spirit has to take its bearings from Aristotle, Aristotle's books on the soul, Hegel contends. He writes, and this is the first quote on the handout. Aristotle's books on the soul, along with his essays on particular aspects and states of the soul, are for this reason still the most admirable, perhaps even the sole work of speculative interest on this topic. The essential aim of a philosophy of spirit can only be to introduce the concept again into the knowledge of spirit and so also to disclose once more the sense of those Aristotelian books. Aristotle provides what rational and empirical psychology lack, a speculative approach. A clue to what this speculative approach of Aristotle amounts to in Hegel's reading is given at the very end of the encyclopedia where Hegel quotes a passage from book 12 of Aristotle's metaphysics. Before turning to this well-known passage, let me just pause to point out that the 1830 edition of the philosophy of spirit is bookended, as it were, by references to Aristotle. 
begins with the claim that the proper philosophical treatment of spirit has to be Aristotelian in nature, and it ends with spelling out the particular Aristotelian claim that has guided the philosophy of spirit all along. Now, why is this passage so important to Hegel that he ends the presentation of his whole system with it? In the chapter devoted to Aristotle in his lectures on the history of philosophy, Hegel reads this passage as describing the nature of absolute spirit, and he calls it the highest point of Aristotle's metaphysics and the most speculative thought that is possible. The structure of self-knowledge that Aristotle describes in this passage is thus the structure of absolute spirit. Since this structure is the most speculative thought that is possible, it is the natural high and end point of the project of a philosophy of spirit, whose aim is to develop a theory of spirit that is on par with Aristotle's model. We may read the passage as providing at least a rough sketch of the structure of absolute spirit that Hegel's philosophy of spirit aims at. By spelling out this structure, we may then get a sketch, still a rough one, of the structure that the syllogisms of the system have to articulate if they are to bring Hegel's project to a sort of closure. So let us turn to Aristotle. This is the second quote on the handout. Active understanding, though, is intrinsically of what is intrinsically best, and the sort that is to the highest degree best of what is to the highest degree best. And the understanding actively understands itself by partaking of the understandable object, for it becomes understandable by touching an understanding one, so that understanding and understandable object are the same. The passage spells out the specific form of self-knowledge in which knows, understands or knows itself completely by knowing knowable objects, noeta, and by merging with the knowable objects in the process of knowing them. Now, Aristotle conceives of this merging of news with its object as a sort of non-propositional and non-intentional knowledge that is different from what he calls the anoetic knowledge, which is discursive, propositional, and intentional. Hegel, who is wary of all forms of non-discursive knowledge, makes it clear that Aristotle's account is flawed and has to be augmented. But the basic structure that interests Hegel is already there in Aristotle namely the structure of a self-reflective knowledge in which spirit knows itself completely by knowing its proper object. Now, if we combine this structure with Hegel's stated aims in the philosophy of spirit, we get two basic premises that form a rough sketch of the structure that the syllogisms of the system have to articulate. Premise one, the aim of the philosophy of spirit is spirit's complete self-knowledge of itself as spirit. This self-knowledge is what Hegel calls absolute spirit. Premise two, the structure of this self-knowledge and thus of absolute spirit is such that spirit knows itself by knowing its proper object. This structure is called noesis noesios. But what is the proper object of spirit? It can only be the object as which spirit manifests itself and is thus able to grasp itself. Spirit manifests itself in different domains, namely in logic, nature, and spirit proper. But all these manifestations are manifestations of the absolute idea, as it is set out in the logic. We may say that the proper object of spirit is the absolute idea in its three different manifestations as logical idea, nature, and spirit. In an addition to paragraph 236 of the Encyclopedia, Hegel says that in the absolute idea, this is quote three on the handout, the idea is its own object, is sich selbst gegenständlich, and identifies this structure of the idea, being its own object, as the Aristotelian noesis noesios. Thus we may claim, and this is the third premise, the proper object of spirit is the absolute idea in its three manifestations as logical idea, nature and spirit. And these three premises provide us with our rough, rough sketch of the structure of absolute spirit. Absolute spirit is the spirit that knows itself completely by knowing the absolute idea as logic, nature, and spirit. I now turn to the second question. Why does self-knowledge take on a syllogistic structure? To answer this question, we must turn to Hegel's criticism of Aristotle's account of noesis noesios. What is lacking in Aristotle's account is, to put it very abstractly, a third term besides nous and its object, the noeton. 
Aristotle articulates the structure of self-knowledge as a relation with two terms, nous and the noeton, where nous knows itself by knowing and thus becoming the noeton. Hegel thinks that this structure is incapable of articulating a stable relation of self-knowledge because the difference between nous and noeton is dissolved in the activity of self-knowledge so that the whole structure collapses into one element, the nous. Aristotle's account of noesis noeseos therefore has to be augmented by cross-breeding it with the central notion of Plato, one that Hegel already describes in his first published work, The Differentschrift, and discusses at length in his lectures on the history of philosophy. Hegel refers to a passage in the Timaeus where Pla Plato introduces the notion of the best bond. Plato writes, and this is quote four on the handout, but it is impossible for any two things to form a proper structure without the presence of a third thing. There has to be some bond to mediate between the two of them and bring them together. The best bond is the one that most effectively unifies itself and the things it is joining. Hegel comments, this is deep, this contains the concept, the idea. So Plato already spelled out what is lacking in Aristotle's formulation of his speculative high point, a third thing that joins to the other two things together. What we need then is a fusion of Aristotle's noesis noesios and Plato's best bond. To have achieved this fusion is, in Hegel's eyes, the most significant contribution that Neoplatonism made to the history of philosophy. Hegel writes, and this is quote five on the handout, thinking that thinks itself, the news that has itself as its object. Thus, in the first place, we have thinking, this has, in the second place, a noeton. Third, these two are identical, thought has itself in its object. This makes three, the one, the other, and the unity of both. We are now in a position to answer the question why Hegel articulates the structure of absolute spirit in a series of syllogisms. The answer is that the syllogism is a structure in which two different terms are mediated and in a certain way unified by a third term. As such, it corresponds to Plato's best bond. In fact, in fact Hegel explicitly claims that what Plato formulates in a childish manner when he speaks of the best bond is the idea of the syllogism of reason, the Vernunftschluss. Hegel says, and this is quote six on the handout, this inference remains the form as it appears in the common syllogism, but as a reason. The differences are the extremes and it is the identity that makes them one. The inference is the speculative which joins itself together with itself in the extremes, insofar as all terms consecutively occupy all positions. In the syllogism, there is the whole of reason, at least in its exteriority. Hegel's identification of the syllogism with the structure of self-knowledge set out by Neoplatonism's fusion of Aristotle and Plato entails that the form of absolute spirit's self-knowledge has to be the form of the syllogism. Hegel further specifies this form by suggesting that in such a syllogism, a syllogism of reason, all terms have to consecutively occupy all position. In this way, they articulate a structure of complete mediation. In his treatment of the syllogistic form in the science of logic, Hegel distinguishes between two ways in which this demand of complete mediation can be satisfied. In the disjunctive syllogism, the demand of complete mediation is met insofar as the middle term, and this is quote seven on the handout, which is posited in it as the totality of the concept itself contains the two extremes in their complete determinateness. We might call this the pure or perfect form of complete mediation, insofar as complete mediation is achieved within one single syllogistic structure. But this perfect form can only be achieved within the realm of pure thought that is articulated in the science of logic. Since the system not only contains logic, but also the so-called real philosophies, philosophy of nature and philosophy of spirit, which do not deal with pure thought, but with thought in actuality, they cannot articulate reason in this perfect form. Actuality, Wirklichkeit, is a thought, is a thought determination of the logic of essence, and is as such a category of relation in which the unity of the relata is only imperfectly achieved. In the logic of the concept, 
Hegel claims that all actuality is, this is quote eight, internally fractured into its ought and its being. This is the absolute judgment on all actuality. This means that where actuality is involved, the complete mediation cannot be achieved in its perfect form, but has to accommodate the fact that this mediation is a mediation of reflection, as Hegel calls it. Thus, complete mediation has to be achieved in an imperfect form. This imperfect form is the circle of three syllogisms in which every term consecutively occupies all positions. The circle is imperfect because the complete mediation that it articulates is a complete mediation merely in itself, as Hegel says. In paragraph 189 of the Encyclopedia, he writes concerning this circle. This is quote nine on the handout. By this means, it has come about with respect to the form that each moment received the determination and position of the middle, hence the whole in general, and with this, it, it has lost the one-sidedness of its abstraction in itself. That the mediation has been completed also only in itself, namely only as a circle of mediations that mutually presuppose one another. The circle of three syllogisms achieves a form of complete mediation, but this mediation is mediation only in itself, insofar as it is only a circle of mediations mutually presupposing each other. The argument of the logic then proceeds toward a form of complete mediation that is not only complete in itself, but complete in and for itself, namely the disjunctive syllogism. But the circle of three syllogisms is not merely a waypoint towards a more perfect form of mediation, Rather, it has its own distinctive use outside the science of logic's realm of shadows, namely in those, those realms where the logic's thought determinations are active in actuality. Since the system deals with two sciences that operate within the realm of actuality, we might be led to conclude that the system itself cannot achieve the perfect form of complete mediation, but has to settle for the second best option. Therefore, the unity of the system and the complete mediation of the three philo philosophical sciences is articulated in a circle of three syllogisms. If we take a look at the terms and their respective position in the three syllogisms, it certainly seems that the syllogisms perform a complete mediation only in the form of a circle. You have this on the handout. The mark of a complete mediation is that every term consecutively occupies every position. This is obviously the case for the three terms, logic, nature, and spirit, in these three syllogisms. The picture, however, becomes more complex once we shift our attention from the position of the terms to their content. As part of our sketch, we have claimed that the absolute idea manifests itself in three different ways, as logic, nature, and spirit. Thus, every syllogism is a mediation between three different manifestations of the absolute idea. Since the middle term is the term that articulates the unity of the extremes, the three different syllogisms articulate three different manifestations of the unity of the system. In paragraph 18 of the encyclopedia, Hegel distinguishes the three manifestations of the idea as follows. This is quote 10 on the handout. First, logic, that is the science of the idea in and for itself. Second, philosophy of nature as the science of the idea in its otherness. And third, philosophy of spirit as the idea returning back to itself from its otherness. Each of these different manifestations articulates a different form of unity of the parts of the system. There is unity in its pure form, that is unity in and for itself, unity in its otherness, and unity in its return to itself from its otherness. But if we have three different unities and three different syllogisms of the system, then the complete mediation that constitutes the unity of the system cannot consist in the mere imperfect form of the circle of three syllogisms. Because a mere circle of mediations which presuppose one another is insufficient if the mediations each take on a different form. Such a circle is incapable of explaining real unity because it just takes us on a ride in a continuous loop through the three different forms of unity without spelling out the overarching unity of the three different manifestations of unity. In other words, if we want real unity, if we want closure of the system, we cannot just point to the existence of three different unities. Instead, we would have to point out how these different forms of unity are themselves forming a unity. 
This can be done in two ways. We can either point to an overarching unity, a sort of meta-unity beyond the three unities of logic, nature, and spirit, and claim that in this unity, everything is finally unified. Or we can show that these unities are not merely different forms of unities, but that one of them is itself a higher form of unity that integrates the other two. Since Hegel claims that the absolute idea is all there is, and that it comes in three and only three manifestations, we may safely rule out the first way of unifying the system. This leaves us with the second way of integrating two unities into a third. Even a superficial look at Hegel's own characterization of, characterization of the three different manifestations of the idea makes it reasonably safe to conclude that logic is the manifestation of the idea that integrates nature and spirit. We can rule out nature because the unity of nature would be a unity of the idea in its otherness. And since this otherness implies exteriority, otherness being a relation of things that are external to each other, the resulting unity would only be a unity of parts that are external to each other. For much the same reason, we may also rule out spirit, because its unity would be the process of returning from the exteriority of otherness to itself, thus presenting a unity that is, as it were, still in the making. The unity of logic, on the other hand, is the unity of the idea in and for itself. Let us have a look at the picture that emerges when we apply these considerations to our sketch of the structure of absolute spirit. We said that absolute spirit is the spirit that knows itself completely by knowing the absolute idea as logic, nature and spirit. What is missing from this sketch is the unity of the absolute idea in its three different manifestations. Based on our considerations, we cannot be content with a mere knowledge of the absolute idea as logic, nature and spirit. Instead, we have to add the consideration that spirit self-knowledge is only complete when it knows the absolute idea in its logical manifestation as the unity of nature and spirit. Our improved sketch now looks something like this. Absolute spirit is the spirit that knows itself completely by knowing the absolute idea as logic, nature and spirit, and by knowing the absolute idea in its logical manifestation as the unity of nature and spirit. My claim is that this is the structure that Hegel aims to articulate in the syllogisms of the system. Before turning to the syllogisms of the system, let me quote a short passage from Hegel's notes on absolute spirit that lends some support to my claim. This is quote 11 on the handout. All three standpoints are unified in one. A, it is the essence of the basic matter that moves along. B, activity of knowing, movement, C, precisely in this, neither subjective nor objective, but the one idea that presents itself and in its development through particular spheres is at the same time moment, this one idea is overview. The syllogisms of the system are the device that articulates these three standpoints, of which the third is the unity of itself and the other two. Looking back at the distinction between the imperfect and the perfect form of complete mediation, we are now able to see that the syllogisms of the system conform neither to the perfect nor to the imperfect form. They do not form a disjunctive syllogism, but neither do they form a circle of three syllogisms in which the three unities remain external to each other. Rather, we have a structure consisting of three syllogisms in which the third integrates the other two. This means we may characterize the specific form of the syllogisms of the system as Hegel's attempt, to elevate the imperfect form of complete mediation to its perfect form by eliminating the remaining externality, namely the externality of the respective mediations to each other. Let us now turn to the text of the syllogisms of the system. And now I'll um, just share my screen. More PowerPoint presentation, nothing fancy, but since I'll be talking about these four quotes a lot. Um, I think it is easier if everyone can have a look at them constantly. So the first thing to notice is that Hegel introduces the syllogisms of the system in paragraph 575 with the remark that it is disappearing which initially grounds the further development. This means we have to read the syllogisms of the system as a further development a development that moves beyond the point reached in the preceding paragraph. In this paragraph, paragraph 574, 
Hegel summarizes the movement that we as diligent readers have followed from the beginning. This concept of philosophy is the self-thinking idea, the knowing truth, the logical with the meaning that it is the universality verified in the concrete content as in its actuality. In this way, science has returned to its beginning and the logical is its result as the spiritual, such that out of the pre presupposing judging in which the concept was only in itself and the beginning was something immediate, thus out of the appearance which it had in it there, the logical has risen into its pure principle and also into its element. What is striking about this summary is that Hegel presents philosophy as having come full circle. Science has returned to its beginning. The logical, which was the beginning of science, is also its result. The circula circularity of the system is already reached before we get to the syllogisms of the system. But if science is already forming a perfect circle, what further development could there be? It is obvious, since the further development is charted in a measly three paragraphs, the further development is not on the same plane as the development that preceded it. Thus it is not a development that depends a further manifestation of the absolute idea to the three already known. The further development rather consists in a fresh look at what is already there, at the circle of science, as it reaches its completion in paragraph 574. In the syllogisms of the system, Hegel asks us to step out, as it were, of the circle of the system and reflect back on how this circle formed itself during a first traverse of the encyclopedia. The result of this reflection is the insight that what you have reached so far and the manner in which we have reached it is not the basic matter in itself, but only its appearance. This realization that the whole course that the encyclopedia charts from paragraph 84 to paragraph 574 is merely an appearance, is itself the cause for the further development that takes the form of the syllogisms of the system. But in what way is the course through the philosophical sciences a mere appearance? Let us have a closer look at the first syllogism. It is this appearing which initially grounds the further development. The first appearance is constituted by the syllogism that has the logical as its ground, its starting point, and nature as the middle that joins the spirit together with the logical. The logical becomes nature, and nature becomes spirit. Nature, which stands between spirit and its essence, does not in fact separate them into extremes of finite abstraction, nor does it separate them into something independent that as another only joins together others. For the syllogism is determined within the idea, and nature is essentially determined only as a transit point and a negative moment and in itself the idea. But the mediation of the concept has the external form of transition, and science has the form of the progress of necessity, so that only in the one extreme is the freedom of the concept positive as it's joining together with itself. The first thing to notice is that Hegel associates the first syllogism, logic nature spirit, with the logic of being. In the 1817 encyclopedia, he emphasizes this by noting that science in this first syllogism has the external appearance of a being. But what exactly is the scope of the identification of the sequence logic nature spirit with the logic of being? It is, of course, tempting to conclude from the identification of the first syllogism with the logic of being that this syllogism is to be read as a syllogism of being there, Schluss des Daseins. But Hegel explicitly excludes such a reading when he says that the middle term, nature, does not separate the extremes, logic and spirit, into extremes of finite abstraction, which is exactly how Hegel defines the syllogism of being there. The syllogism of being there is a syllogism of the understanding because its terms are singular, abstract determinations. But the first syllogism of the system is, as Hegel says, determined within the idea. Thus, it is not a syllogism that joins together finite elements that are external to each other. After all, what is joined together in all syllogisms of the system is only the absolute idea in different manifestations. And since there is nothing external to the absolute idea, there is no joining together of elements that are external to each other. 
But even if we do not read the first syllogism as a syllogism of being there, an element of externality remains, and it is this element that explains the character of mere appearance. This externality is intimately connected with the mode of development proper to the logic of being, namely transition, übergehen. Hegel says that in this syllogism, the mediation of the concept has the external form of transition. So it is not the terms themselves that are external to each other, but their mediation takes on an external form, the form of transition. In transition, as Hegel explains in paragraph 84 of the Encyclopedia, the elements in question are others opposite one another, and their further determination is a process of passing over into another. This is what happens in the first syllogism, whose structure is the structure of the encyclopedia itself. We start with logic and pass over into nature as the other of logic, and then pass from nature to spirit. What is deficient about this mo mode of development that Hegel calls transition is that it fails to articulate the essential unity between the elements that pass over into another. Thus, when we pass from one category of being to onto another, say from something to other, we are not aware of the relation between the two, but we, as Hegel says, pass on. We think one category, then we think another, without being aware of their essential relatedness. In passing on, one category takes the place of the former, and thus the former category seems to become the latter. This is what happens in the first syllogism, as Hegel points out. He says the logical becomes nature, and nature becomes spirit. We may explain this efficiency from another angle. Since in the first syllogism, nature occupies the middle term, and since nature is the idea in its otherness, the unity of the system articulated in the first syllogism is a unity whose elements appear to stand in a relation of otherness to each other. So, although the terms of the first syllogism are not really external to each other, they appear to be external to each other because of the mode of development proper to the encyclopedia. Having reached the end of the circle, we are of course aware of the essential unity of the three manifestations of the idea, but we were not aware of this from the beginning. We did not begin with a consciousness of the unity of the absolute idea, but only came to a re realization of this unity in the process of transition from logic to nature to spirit. This is why Hegel says that only in the one extreme is the freedom of the concept posited as it's joining together with itself. This extreme is spirit. Only in spirit we become aware of the essential unity of the absolute idea and of the circularity of the system of the philosophical sciences. In the beginning, we arbitrarily occupied a certain standpoint, the standpoint of immediacy. For the development that Hegel speaks of aims to sublate this arbitrariness and the unmediated immediacy of the standpoint we took in the beginning by articulating the essential unity of the manifestations of the absolute idea. The next step in this development is taken in the second syllogism of the system, in which spirit is the middle term that mediates nature with logic. In the second syllogism, this appearance is sublated insofar as this syllogism is already the standpoint of spirit itself, which is the mediator of the process, presupposes nature and joins it together with the logical. It is the syllogism of spiritual reflection within the idea. Science appears as a subjective cognition whose aim is freedom and which is itself the way to produce its freedom. The second syllogism uh, sublates the appearance of the first since the syllogism is the standpoint of spirit itself, thus the standpoint of self-knowledge and of reason. Whereas in the first syllogism, we only reach the standpoint of spirit in the end and only then we're able to recognize the essential relatedness of logic and nature, in the second syllogism, we occupy the standpoint of spirit, which is the standpoint of relating nature and logic. When Hegel calls this syllogism the syllogism of spiritual reflection, he characterizes it as a syllogism determined by the logic of essence in the same way that he characterized the first syllogism as determined by the logic of being. Here, in the logic of essence, the relevant mode of development is no longer transition, but the shining, the shining in something opposite, thus a mode of development that articulates the relation between the elements. Again, 
I think it would be misleading to read the syllogism as the syllogism of reflection as it is set out in the logic of the concept. Rather, the model with which we have to work here is the process of subjective cognition, which is charted in the section on subjective spirit in the philosophy of spirit. This is why Hegel says that in the syllogism of spiritual reflection, science appears as subjective cognition. Subjective cognition is tied to reflection insofar as subjective cognition operates within a specific framework of the logic of reflection, which Hegel calls external reflection. The abstract definition of external reflection is that it is a reflection that presupposes a being, as Hegel says, but in positing, immediately sublates its positing, and so it has an immediate presupposition. Applied to the specific case of subjective cognition, this means that the cognizing subject is directed at the object of cognition as something which is given to it and external to it. But the externality and the givenness of the object are merely the result of external reflection, insofar as they are posited by the subject itself, but posited as not posited. When we are positing something as being given to us, we are positing it as something that is not posited by us. Thus we posit and immediately sublate our positing. This is what happens in the syllogism of spiritual reflection. Spirit presupposes nature as an object of cognition, this spirit is not absolute spirit, but subjective spirit. And thus the standpoint of spirit taken in the second syllogism is a standpoint of particular individuals, einzelne or individual, as Hegel writes in his notes on absolute spirit. The presupposition of nature by spirit, thus is the presupposition that is active in, sub in the subjective cognition of nature. The course of this subjective cognition is charted in the encyclopedia section on subjective spirit. The cognizing subject is confronted with a world, nature, that is given to it by a sensation. The process of subjective cognition then proceeds to consecutively sublate the externality of nature given in sensation via the stages of intuition, representation and finally the concept. The upshot of the process of cognition is thus the elimination of the externality of nature that ends in the recognition that, ends in the recognition that the categorical structure of the absolute idea has always already been at work in the process of subjective cognition. Now, while the second syllogism sublates the appearance prevalent in the first, it is itself only an appearance. The mediating term, subjective spirit, is on the one hand spirit and thus self-knowledge, but as sub subjective spirit, it has not yet reached this self-knowledge. It is merely in the process of or rather, it is itself the process of self-knowledge, or as Hegel says, it is itself the way to produce its freedom. Since spirit is the idea returning back to itself from its otherness, the mediation it performs as the middle term of the second syllogism consists in the very process of returning from otherness to itself. Thus we are in need of a third syllogism, but not one that presents yet a third mediation that stands alongside the first two, but rather one that integrates and unifies them. Hegel describes this last syllogism in paragraph 577. The third syllogism is the idea of philosophy, which has self-knowing reason, the absolutely universal for its middle. A middle that divides into spirit and nature, making spirit the presupposition as the process of the idea's subjective activity, and nature the universal extreme as the process of the idea that is in itself objective. The self-judging of the idea into the two appearances determines them as its self-knowing reasons, manifestations, and in it a unification takes place. It is the concept, the nature of the subject matter that moves onwards and develops, and this movement is equally the activity of cognition. The eternal idea, the idea that is in and for itself, eternally re remains active, engenders and enjoys itself as absolute spirit. As we would expect by now, the third syllogism is associated with the form of development proper to the logic of the concept, which Hegel calls self-judging. In this phrase, Hegel takes up Hölderlin's incorrect etymology of Urteilen as ursprüngliches Teilen, which may be rendered as primordial division. Hegel thus presents the absolute idea in its logical manifestation 
as primordially dividing itself into the first and second syllogism of the system, the two appearances, as Hegel calls them. Since the logical divides itself not into spirit and nature, but into the syllogisms of the system that have nature and spirit as their respective middles, the third syllogism is a mediation of extremes that are themselves complete syllogisms. In other words, the third syllogism performs a mediation of terms that are themselves mediations. Spirit and nature do not appear in it as isolated manifestations of the idea, but as the processes of mediation charted in the first two syllogisms. As the self-movement of science charted in the encyclopedia, mediated by nature, and as the process of subjective cogn cognition, mediated by spirit. The third syllogism is a mediation of the first two mediations. Hegel speaks of a unification that takes place in the syllogism. This unification thus is not a unification of the different parts of the system, but a higher order unification, namely a unification of the unities of the first and second syllogism. Since these syllogisms are explicitly presented by Hegel as unification processes, the unification of unities becomes a unification of unification processes. Thus, the process of the objective development of science and the process of the subjective cognition are both sublated in the higher order unification that takes place in the third syllogism. The third and last syllogism of the system articulates the structure of complete self-knowledge as we have set it out in our sketch. We said, absolute spirit is the spirit that knows itself completely by knowing the absolute idea as logic, nature and spirit and by knowing the absolute idea in its logical manifestation as the unity of nature and spirit. In the third syllogism, absolute spirit satisfies the demands of self-knowledge by knowing the absolute idea in its logical manifestation as the unity of the absolute idea in its manifestation as nature and spirit. By completing the self-knowledge of absolute spirit, the third syllogism effectively closes the system, but not by leading it to its beginning, but rather by folding in its loose ends. The eternal idea is all there is divides itself not into two isolated manifestations of itself, but into two syllogistic mediations of itself, the mediation of nature and the mediation of spirit. Both, both mediations articulate two different processes, the movement of the basic matter itself and the process of subjective cognition. These processes both form part of spirit's self-knowledge. The first process, logic, nature, spirit, is the process of the scientific development of spirit. The second process, nature, spirit, logic, is the process of spirit achieving self-knowledge. By integrating both processes, absolute spirit knows itself as absolute spirit and reaches complete self-knowledge. Since all externality is now sublated, since the processes of development and of achieving self-knowledge are themselves not anterior to spirit's absolute self-knowledge, but only appearances of its self-knowledge. Spirit is no longer only in the process of gaining self-knowledge. Rather, it is revealed that absolute spirit always already is absolute spirit and always already is in command of complete self-knowledge. The absolute command of the philosophy of spirit, know thyself, is thus no longer applicable to absolute spirit. The process of knowledge is no longer an arduous process of eliminating externality, of recognizing categorial structures in nature, but rather the leisurely process of always already knowing that, that the process of self-knowledge is always already completed. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Uh, okay, we'll move straight to Q&A. Uh, so first we have Sebastian. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. Um, I have a question about the final or S2. Um, <clears throat> if the third syllogism says that it's the logical idea that um, is the mediating term and therefore the center uh, around which everything is explained, and um, I think you, uh, you ended the quotes of the third syllogism also with the um, absolute idea being the subject, then shouldn't it be that the knowledge that includes the whole system is the logical idea that uh, knows itself to be spirit and nature 
so that the true subject of knowledge is uh, the absolute idea and not spirit. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I I thought about this a lot. What is what is in the end? What is the the um, true subject of this process? And I think that when you look at the text um, of the last paragraph. Um, then I think it becomes clear that it is um, absolute spirit that is the, the, the subject of the whole um, process. But we have to say that it is the eternal idea in its manifestation as, as absolute spirit. And, and this um, idea in the manifestation um, as absolute spirit has sort of two um, sides to it or, or two um, things that are um, logically anterior to it you could say but not temporally and then these two processes are the process of um, subjective cognition and the process of the logical development of the concept of spirit this is what what is charted in the in the um in the encyclopedia itself i think what what hegel try, is trying to do and i try to um work out this structure is he tries to present a, a necessary development through the um, philosophical sciences, logic, nature, spirit. And in the end, um, um, he tries to show that this um, um, development um, has to take into account two um, different standpoints. Namely, um, we have to first understand the logical structure of something like absolute spirit. And this is what the course that um, goes from logic to nature to spirit does. And we have to understand how this um, process is in itself a project of self-knowledge. Yeah, namely, I, I, I that, but yeah. it, isn't it the second syllogism that says that spirit is the subject, and the third syllogism says that it's always the idea, and spirit yeah. is just the form of the idea. So, so in truth, spirit is the idea. It's only the idea in its active form. The second syllogism already takes care of the notion that. Um, it's spirit is a subject that, that yeah. knows itself, but that, that contradicts your formulation that, uh, uh, that absolute spirit is the subject because the true subject is the self-knowing idea and it knows itself in the form of the absolute idea. Mm -hmm. it, just, it just uses its form of spirit yeah. to know itself, but the true subject is the idea and not, not spirit and not absolute spirit. Yeah, yeah, okay, I see your point now, but I think the, the problem you're raising is one that, that is um, um, caused by, by Hegel's way of, of speaking about these processes, because um, when we talk about this, we, we um, and I, I did this the whole time, we, um, we make a difference or, or we, um, we, um, we make a difference between the idea and its three different manifestations. And I think that this difference has to um, disappear in the end. That uh, we can no longer, when, uh, uh, when we have reached absolute spirit in the last syllogism, we can no longer um, make a difference between the absolute idea in its guise as logic, spirit, or nature, and absolute spirit. We can no longer say that behind the three different manifestations, is always the absolute idea. This is, this is of course, the correct. The, the subject is always the absolute idea, but in the end, the subject um, is the absolute idea as absolute spirits and the two merge. There is no difference to be made between the two. And what is, um, you're of course correct that, that spirit is already introduced as the subject of the process in the second syllogism, but it is, and I think Hegel points that out. It is spirit first as subjective spirit that is in the process of gaining self-knowledge of itself as absolute spirit. And this process is in the last um, syllogism shown to be something that is always already completed in absolute spirit. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think maybe we're just, uh, I'm just maybe mis misunderstanding um, what you mean. Maybe we mean the same and I just think we disagree. <laughs> but um, I thought, this notion that that it's always already self-knowledge mm -hmm. what is happening in all the three syllogism but but which is only um, explicit in the last uh, th this notion of, of self-knowing is itself the form of the um, absolute idea and, and so cannot be um, relational uh, to something else uh, mm -hmm. which, which would be if spirit if the idea as spirit were the subject uh, that relates to something else that's the second syllogism 
Um, and that's cognition, because cognition is cognition of something else, so it's relational, so it's other relational. Although, as you said, I mean, it's all happening within the idea, so all otherness is already within the idea, but it's only the third syllogism that it is explicit that all mm -hmm. otherness is within yeah. the idea. And that's only the case because um, the true subject of knowing is revealed to be the self-referring idea in, in the form of the idea, and not in the form of spirit, and not in the form of spirit that relates to something else. But mm -hmm. I think we're probably saying the same thing um, if, if you say that uh, ultimately, of course, a spirit is the idea. And so the form of knowing itself uh, of spirit is the form of the idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, Dylan? Yes, well, thank you very much for that uh, very interesting talk. I must say I uh, agree with it uh, wholeheartedly. And now I, I had really two questions. Uh, one of them, sort of Sebastian has already gotten at, which is about this relationship between the absolute idea and absolute spirit, in particular, the absolute idea in its logical mode or its universal mode, as Hegel will say. Um, and maybe thinking about it, if I would draw in, as you did, uh, the Aristotelian, Platonic Aristotelian, Neoplatonic uh, uh, heritage for this uh, thought, the absolute idea in its logical mode as divine noose in Aristotle's terms, thought thinking itself eternally, as opposed to absolute spirit being our noose raised up to philosophical contemplation, which we want to say there's some speculative identity between the divine noose and noose as absolute spirit or between divine contemplation, the eternal idea, the internal contemplation of the idea, and our philosophical contemplation, which, you know, arises within time, but also sublates the time form, of course. So if, you know, you may have basically already answered that. So if there's any more you might have to say about that. But the, the second question now would be about enjoyment, which I suppose the title of the talk, Enjoy Thyself. Uh, uh, I may have missed, or maybe it was more implicit, you know, your understanding of what this enjoyment is of course it comes in, in the final sentence of the encyclopedia but in my own thinking I, i'm still trying to find out figure out for myself what what is this enjoyment that absolute spirit uh gives us the idea enjoys itself as absolute spirit you know maybe to make that more specific right it couldn't be a mere feeling of enjoyment could it because feeling is you know not quite thinking which is uh better and higher and so on but then uh, uh, yes, in, enjoyment. What what is a very very broad question, but uh, I'd love it if you maybe can shed some light on that for me. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you for for both questions. So, well, uh, if I may um, add something to the first question, with this, which is the question that that um, Sebastian and I just discussed. I think you could um, frame it in um, within the whole frame of of um, Aristotelian news. It could say that that Hegel sort of rehashes the relationship that in Aristotle exists between human news and divine news, which is, of course, um, another thorny issue. So um, um, maybe that doesn't make uh, things any clearer. But I think um, if you look at it that way, you could say that the things that happen in the first two syllogisms are um, told from the perspective of human news and only in the last um, syllogism, um, we are sort of ascending to the structure of divine news. And this, um, this ascending means a sort of revelation or recognition that what we are doing um, in these cognition processes and in this development process of the concept of spirit in the encyclopedia is something that is always already happening inside or within the absolute idea. And then the whole question of what the, the subject of the process is sort of disappears because it all um, um, collapses into one that would be in, in Aristotle. Of course, Hegel thinks that we have to make um, a distinction between three terms um, to stop them from collapsing in, into, into a, a one so that the whole structure would disappear. Um, and uh, the second um, question I would would try although i will try to answer that by going back to, to aristotle once again actually i i wanted to say something about enjoying 
um, and, and enjoyment since it is in the title of my talk and I only realized that after writing the talk. So I, I wrote another half page but the, the talk was already um, long enough so I'm, I'm very thankful for, for you for, to you for asking that question. I think, um, let me just check my notes. I think that um, Hegel here um, rehashes again some, some Aristotelian thoughts, maybe when, when Aristotle talks about um, the divine news in, in metaphysics, um, he uses a, a curious term, um, it's a diagoge in Greek, which, which literally means a process of carrying through, it can mean teaching or instruction, as in carrying someone through a subject, but it can also mean the passing of life and in extension um, a way of passing one's time, uh, so it can be translated, and this is how Reef translates it in his, in his recent translation as pastime. Thus, God's pastime, as Aristotle describes it, um, consists in his self-knowledge. And um, in the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle explains that the best pastimes are those that are self-sufficient um, activities insofar as they have an end in themselves, that they do not seek an end beyond themselves. So if I, I um, build a house, the end is the... The end of my um, my activity is the, the house, and once the house is built, my activity ceases. In self-knowledge and in all other infinite activities, this is not the same because the process of self-knowledge is itself the end of the activity. So the activity is infinite because whenever I reach this end, I'm still doing the, the same activity. And Aristotle th thinks that these activities are the, the best activities and they give us the highest pleasure and there's no higher form of enjoyment to be had. And I think that, that Hegel simply um, riffs on this um, idea of Aristotle when, when he in the end um, says that absolute spirit enjoys itself. Um, because I, I sort of hinted at that in my last, in the, in the last part of the talk when I said that the, the absolute command of the philosophy of spirit, the Delphic Maxim, know thyself, no longer applies to to absolute spirit because it's nothing else than self-knowledge. So the command would be um, enjoy that self. That would have been the point of the of of my talk. But um, really, that is that is all I can say about this this enjoyment. That I think that this is just a, uh, a riff on the thought of of Aristotle. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bernard. Um, I'm going to ask you to Hi, um, I have a, a sort of weird question about the Timaeus, um, and it gets it gets at the question of this third thing. Um, I, in a way, I guess my question can be put: Why not two things, and why not four things? Um, because what happens in the Timaeus um, is that what imme what immediately happens is that after talking about the third thing. Plato goes on to talk about two middles, right? Not just one middle, but two middles. And I have no idea how Hegel might have taken that up and what that would mean for Hegel. But then he goes on to talk about how you then derive four things, not, not three things. So you have two things, fire and, and earth, and then you derive this middle bond, and then somehow you have water and uh, whatever that, that air, I guess. Um, so I don't, I don't know whether this is the kind of thing that um, is that all applicable to thinking about Hegel? But if there were two middles that Hegel is thinking about just to maintain this analogy, which is, which doesn't seem plausible, but I, I don't know what it would be because this higher order unity that you're talking about only sounds like this fourth thing that you were trying to avoid as a kind of thing that's external to the sort of circular unity. Um, I, I don't know what to make of it. I, I don't know. I guess another way of putting this question is, if he's turning to Plato to criticize Aristotle, why did he stop at the Plato right there, um, at the third thing, at the syllogistic structure? Um, another way of putting it, um, why not four, but why not two, is if you take a penny, you know, you have two sides of the coin. Um, you can say that the coin itself is the third thing, the unity of the two. But I mean, at some point, I'm, I'm just wondering, is this, um, what exactly is motivating the, the idea of this triadic unity, especially since in the Timaeus, the unity um, is the fact that all of these terms are interchangeable, not the fact that there is a third thing. Uh, 
Um, at least that's that's my rough reading of it. So I don't know what to make of it. Um, you're muted. Yeah, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, if, if you um, thank you for the question. I think if you if you read through the whole of the lectures. Um, on the history of philosophy, you notice a few things, and one of one of the things you might notice is that um, Hegel is um, explicitly looking for triad triadic structures in the thinkers that that preceded him. And I think the first um, instant where he finds triadic structures is the Pythagoreans, and then the second instance is is Plato, and he talks about this this fourth element, but he he doesn't take it up. Um, in the in the preceding and in, in the following lectures, I mean, and um, what is central for him then becomes apparent only in his lectures on on um, the on modern philosophy that starts in Hegel with um, um, Francis Bacon and with Jakob Böhme, which is a is a curious combination. Um, usually, we would pair um, Bacon as the the, the arch empiricist with Descartes, the rationalist. But um, Hegel pairs um, um, Bacon with Jakob Böhme. And the reason he does that is that, that Böhme said that everything in nature um, shows us the form of the Trinity and everything can be interpreted in the form of the Trinity. And this is what Hegel um, tries to do, but he claims that the Trinity, as it is um, articulated in, in Christian theology, is only, as he says, a childish form. Um, of the triadic structure and, and so he thinks that um, it was the Pythagoreans and then especially Plato in his um, Timaeus who first articulated this triadic structure that is the true structure of reason and he follows this thought through um, the history of philosophy that's why Neoplatonism is so important to him in this um, respect and I think he, he just um, does not really take up then the the, um, the notion of the two middles and, and the four elements because he cannot use it in in his own system. So I don't think that it has any um, um, that it does have any ramifications for his own system. In the end, it's just something that he notices and he thinks Plato goes wrong there. The the important thing um, for him is really just this short passage that I quoted. He talks about that. That Plato, of course, means this in um, in the sense of mathematical proportions, but that is that uh, is um, also a thing that is not important for Hegel. The only thing that he focuses on is this triadic structure, this idea um, that is put forth in the quote that we need a third thing to unify the other two. And this is a structure that he um, explicitly is looking for in other philosophers, and that turns up again and again, of course, in his own system. Can I can I very briefly ask because I I thought you might refer to the Trinity I mean um, which would suggest that this turn to Plato is itself um, overdetermined or just a, to put it crudely a pretext um, for this um, conclusion he he had already arrived at that triadic unity is, is the proper type of unity but if so how would this theological possibly theological reading affect um, your interpretation. I mean, there seems to be an obvious way in which it would support it by suge suggesting that the spirit um, is um, a, a subject um, in some way, um, as opposed to the father, the son, or um, I don't know. I mean, would, would a theological interpretation at all affect your reading? I I'm not sure um, how a, a theological reading would, would affect this reading because I do not think that if you um, read Hegel as trying to articulate the logical structure that underlies the Trinity, that you're um, by that committing yourself to a theological interpretation because um, as he presents it in his lectures on the history of philosophy, he makes, makes it explicit that the Trinity is um, not a Christian idea but a philosophical one that was imported into Christianity by the church 
fathers. So he thinks that is, it is a generally philosophical idea and it appears in Christianity in its childish form, as he says. So um, he thinks that is, it is something with which you can make sense of Christianity, but not the other way around. It's, it is not Christianity that it can make sense of, of, um, of philosophy, but philosophy makes sense of Christianity. So I don't think that um, that um, reading the logic as trying to arrive at the logic of, of um, Trinitarian structures, so to speak, does commit you to a, um, to a theological reading. And I think that um, Hegel um, sort of justifies this attempt in the um, logic of the concept in the first chapter of the subjectivity um, section, which is, is called on the concept when he talks about universality, particularity, and singularity. These are the three terms of his Trinitarian logic, if you would um, call it this way. But I don't think that it commits you um, to, a, to a theological reading. I, I'm, I can see how, how one might think that, but I think it is um, not something that you necessarily have to follow up on. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Thank you for the talk. It was very interesting. Really, it, it cleared up like um, quite a lot of confusions for me. Uh, but um, I have just one question. It's pro probably a kind of clarificatory one, actually. Uh, it's on the notion of self knowledge because it seems that like you kind of centralize the, the self knowledge or kind of like put in the center of the system and and then kind of like conclude that the the self knowledge is the kind of like closing the circle in a sense, or the purpose of closing circle is just um, attaining the, the, some sort of like self knowledge within the system, right? Um, my question is basically um, like kind of the the idea of self knowledge in relation to phenomenology, because in the end of the phenomenology, we also have the absolute idea, spirit that knows itself by limiting by knowing the limits um, to which it faces, uh, and thereby knowing the limits of itself it knows itself and this is some sort of like in a sense absolute knowing but it's kind of limited because it's kind of limited to the eye or that hegel also argues that in absolute knowing we have the kind of 50 victim like the i is equal i to i um but in the last syllogism particularly the third i mean third syllogism that you uh brought up like we have something more than self-knowing actually because in there the idea or the, the idea of philosophy doesn't know itself in 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 its, in, in, its, in its instantiations, like um, like in nature, in spirit, or in, in or in in the logic. But it does more. Like it, it does, for instance, judging. It in a sense kind of uh, diversifies its constituents, right? At the same time, it syllogizes. It kind of unifies them. So in a sense, uh, in the third syllogism, we have something more than just self-knowing. Therefore, shouldn't it be the, a little bit problematic to think that the whole um, system kind of attains the self-knowledge in the third syllogism? Because the very idea of self-knowledge seems very um, insufficient. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, I think that, um, that this is a question that leads to the question of how to interpret it, the whole of, of of Hegel's system, which is, is um, of course, um, something which follows from the topic of the, of the syllogisms of the system. Um, I think when, when you look at the, you mentioned the phenomenology, um, and when you look at the transition from the phenomenology to the logic, um, I think we have to read this, that the, the phenomenology as a, as a sort of propedeutic um, um, work to, to the system. It is an introduction to the system and it, it ends with absolute knowledge and Hegel claims that this um, absolute knowledge is the structure with which we start out, from which we set out in the in the logic. So we start with pure being. So you could say that pure being is itself um, a structure of absolute knowledge, but a structure which, uh, which is wholly unarticulated. And I think you could say, and probably you should say that the, um, that even the category of pure being is an attempt um, at spirit's own 
self-knowledge, but it is a completely undeveloped attempt of spirit to know itself because, as, as you know, um, when you start reading that, there's nothing to know in, in pure being. And so you can read the whole of the system as, as a, um, a sort of um, diversification, first of the, the categorical structure, then a diversification of the categorical structure of the absolute idea in nature and then in spirit and then in the end there's um always sounds like something um that is so easy that there's just a realization that that is um that was what has always been there and uh, i just realized that now but that is um what i've always been working with so i think um you could um to answer your question you could uh, you should read the whole of um, um Hicks philosophy the system as a process of of self knowledge in the sense of an internal um, articulation of absolute spirit in its constituents or of the absolute idea if you if you like that better in its cons, uh, constituent elements but that i'm sorry can i just add up something yeah um, sure. is that self knowledge is something distinct from absolute knowing because i mean in absolute knowing we have also the self knowledge right and if we are talking about those two things as something identical or let's say same or similar yeah. then we have a problem because like in absolute knowing we don't have judging we don't have syllogizing and then these are quite important how say concepts for us yeah. in, in, in first religion, right? so in a sense i'm just asking like whether yeah. your understanding of self knowledge is something distinct from the one that we see in the absolute knowing in the phenomenon yeah yeah, yeah. okay if we put it this way i would say that um the, the um, self-knowledge that you have at the end of the system is of course one that can um, remember, um, if we can put it this way, um, all the um, different thought determinations that have been articulated since the start of the logic. So it can, it can remember um, judgings, uh, judgments and syllogisms and so on. It is able to articulate this self-knowledge in syllogistic structures. Which is obviously something that is not there in absolute knowing at the end of the phenomenology slash beginning of the logic. That's what I meant that uh, when I said that we have to read, maybe read the, the whole um, system as a, a development of this self knowledge, and that the first category is also uh, an attempt, a totally crude and inadequate attempt uh, at self knowledge because it is one that, that works with only one category and as, as you say one that works without judgment and without syllogisms but the last stage of, of self-knowledge of course can remember and can use um, all these categories can use forms of judgments forms of syllogisms to articulate self-knowledge and this is something that was not possible at the beginning of the system and was not possible in absolute knowing mm -hmm. thank you Thank you. Yeah, go. Um, yeah, well, thank you very much for your talk. Um, my question relates to the question um, uh, of how the, micro, uh, the macroscopic structure relates to the microscopic structure. So um, if we look at the form of absolute spirit, i.e. the mediation of logic, nature and spirit, and if we contrast uh, it to our first reading of uh, the system, uh, Hegel call, calls this um, the uh, first acquaintance with logic, the Asubkantschaft mit der Logik. It's uh, in his second preface um, of the second edition to the logic there, he distinguishes between uh, different kinds of readings uh, depending on what we already know about the system. So if we take your um, structure, your syllogistic structure of uh, the absolute idea and apply it, um, let's say, to the beginning of logic or even to the beginning of nature, um, in what way do we find spirit? Um, so this is basically a question of if we reach the end of Hegel's logic, we should be in a theoretical position to apply the structure all all over the system, and um, would you would you agree to this reading? And um, if so, how would you interpret, for instance, the beginning of um, logic due to the 
first acquaintance with the system because obviously we don't know we do not know what the spirit is once we are at the beginning of, of nature um, is, is my question clear um, mm -hmm. um sort of I, i'll try to answer it and then um, sure. you can tell me if i if yeah. i um got the question right um, no problem. um, um well um I think you you can um, sort of apply the structure that that um, that you get to in the end um, to your reading of the logic. But um, when you when you look at the special case of the beginning, I mean, this is a this is a very curious case, as has been noted countless times, um, because here Hegel asks us to abstract as much as possible from all content of of um, thought and um i think what what is such an applica application would show you um is that it is not that that important if you if you um to manage this because the the beginning in, in hegel the beginning with pure being is not the really the thing that matters in hegel because of the circularity um of the system which means that when you um, follow this circularity um you should sort of um, reach every category um, that can be reached um, in your, if you describe the circle, you're bound to, to reach every category that can be reached at least once. So you could also start with um, with other categories. And there there is another um, introduction um, to the, the system that Hegel um, wrote late in life, his, namely his um, lectures on the um, proofs um, of God, um, which also serve as a sort of introduction to the to the system or to the logic, because he inter interprets the proofs as the elevation of spirit to God, and with God he only means the absolute idea. So the elevation of spirit to God is the elevation um, into pure thinking that is articulated in the um, thought determinations of the logic and, and there um, one example that he gives is the cosmological argument that um, um, works with the, um, the category of cause and when you think about this argument you start thinking about the category of cause and then you're somewhere in the in the logic of essence and then you start following the circle of the system you started with cause not with being but since the whole system is a circle you're bound to to um, reach pure being um, so, and I think this is um, one um, way in which an application of the knowledge that you reach at the end can can sort of um, influence your reading of, of specific parts of the system. Um, but I, I don't do not think that was what you had in mind with, with an application, um, or was it? Um, well, I didn't mean to say uh, like uh, I didn't mean to speak. Uh, uh, about application in the very strict, uh, in the very strict sense that you have something external and then you apply some kind of methodology um, onto it. But uh, the idea is simply um, to to rephrase it. If if you reach the end, you have uh, what what you call can call some kind of a sublimation of all the different stages. And uh, what Hegel and this is how I understood your talk provides us uh, with is a certain kind of mediation of uh, different of extremes and uh, certain terms. And if this is the final stage, of course, we should be in a position to uh, uh, like apply, like to, uh, to rephrase um, um, this kind of, uh, like the content of the system with this kind of structure. And my question is, is in a way open, you know? Uh, so my question is basically uh, to ask, um, if you think that this kind of uh, mediation between the uh, certain terms at the end we have uh, in order to um, evaluate the system of, uh, of Hegel, we have to be able to be in a position to reformulate every thought in the system with this kind of structure. If, um, if you would agree to this, uh, to this challenge that, that we would have to face with, uh, with, with Hegel, when we reach the absolute idea okay is, is it better now okay. yeah yeah um i'm i'm not quite sure um because um the way i i read the 
the three last syllogisms is that that um the structure of the whole system is the structure as it is set out or described only in the first syllogism and the second and the third syllogisms are an uh, attempt to move beyond this structure and and um articulate the the structure of absolute spirit as something that is more than just this structure that emerges during the traverse of the system. Um, and what I, um, but I think you can, um, you can make use of this structure that emerges in the end insofar as, for example, in the first syllogism, um, Hegel says that science um as it progresses to through um logic nature and spirit takes on the form of necessity and um i think you could apply this um to the notorious um transition from from logic to nature where, where hegel says what happens is that uh, the ideas the idea freely um lets itself go sich frei and lässt and i i never could make um any sense out of that and um maybe something can be made if we apply this this insight that he formulates in the end that science takes on the appearance um of of necessity um maybe you can apply this to this transition because that would seem to contradict what hegel says there at the end of the logic and then you could maybe work um um work this out by insisting on the fact that hegel speaks of the appearance of necessity there um I think that this might be a way to to apply this this um, um, structure that emerges in the end through the through the um, microscopic structure of the system. But I think um, it is difficult to to take this structure that then emerges in the second and the third syllogism and apply it to um, to the microscopic structure that means to to certain transitions. Um, of the system because all of these transitions of the system um, occur in the guise of necessity as the first syllogism says so that their form is the form as it is set out in the first syllogism okay. did you get what i'm what yeah I mean? i'm i'm getting what you what you mean yeah thanks okay thank you uh, i have one last question uh, if I understood your your uh, sort of concluding point correctly, uh, is your reading of the conclusion of the third syllogism that uh, there is no longer any difference between the three moments of the system, that externality is sublated to the point that they are uh, just uh, identical with each other? Is that correct? Is that what I understood? Um, no, I, I don't think that is, this is what I meant because that cannot be the case. Because if that were the case, then Hegel would have the same problem that he perceives Aristotle as having. And um, that would be something, um, the structure that you described, that would to lead to, to something that, that happens within the, the science of logic, namely in the transition from subjectivity to objectivity. Because as you know, when, when Hegel there reaches the disjunctive syllogisms and the complete mediation there, um, he describes this perfect form of the complete mediation and then suddenly says, and therefore the disjunctive syllogism is no longer a syllogism and it tra um, makes a transition into objectivity. So you're suddenly in, in another realm and it is, it is noteworthy, I think, that while the um, mode of progression proper to the logic of the concept is self-judging, um, Hegel explicitly describes this transition from subjectivity to objectivity as a, sub as a transition, a übergehen, that means as a mode of development proper to the um, logic of being. And I think if, um, um, if you read the um the last syllogism in the manner that you described something similar would have to happen according to Hegel's logic then you would again um be standing there with pure being in your hands and the whole thing um starts from the beginning but i think what Hegel tries to uh, or wants to articulate is rather structure in which um in the identity of absolute spirit the differences um between the different manifestations of um the absolute idea are somehow 
retained, but only as appearances. That, that's why he always insists on, on, on this, um, on pointing out that these are appearances. Because if, on the one hand, you, um, I think you're in, in, you are in a sort of conundrum at the end. If, if you insist on the, the identity of the, the different manifestations too much, then um, the, all the differences appear and then um, the, the whole structure of self-knowledge disappears. But if you insist on the differences too much, as I probably have done in, in my rough sketch, then, then um, you, um, you caught the question that Sebastian asked. And then the question arises, what is the, the subject? Is it the absolute idea? Is it absolute spirit? And the, the, the Hegel would, have, would say, uh, no, it's, it's both, of course. There is no difference to be made. The difference that you make is a difference in appearance. So, um, and I think Hegel tries to, to steer this, this course um, to steer a course between these two extremes, and I don't know if he, if he's success, successful, but I think, um, to answer your question, no, I don't think that you should read the last structure as um, a structure in which all differences between the terms disappear, because that would, would be, um, um, I think, inimical to the thing that, that Hegel is trying to do here. I agree, yeah. And actually, whilst you were giving a talk, I was uh, thinking about precisely this move from syllogism to objectivity to mechanism. And I was entertaining the same thought, what would happen if we gave that reading? Uh, but uh, I, I reached a, a slightly different conclusion to the one you reached, because you see, I think that the move from syllogism to mecha is mechanism and, and sort of objectivity is, doesn't threaten a move to uh, pure being, but threatens uh, immediacy, right? That's the first moment of mechanism. It's an immediate identity. And I wonder if, because, you know, up until now, every, every time we reach a new moment in the logic, you know, we always sort of, we first approach it in its immediacy, then we think a bit about it more and it sort of opens up, it's different, and we get further along as it were. And I wonder if this is also the, 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 the state that we're at in the conclusion of the logic that we've put together these three moments, we've unified them, and it's no different to what happens before, you know, they're in their immediacy. Um, and if we start thinking about them some more, uh, the difference becomes apparent, they sort of break apart and thought, as he says, engenders itself and it continues and it goes on and so forth. Um, but that was really more of a reflection than a question. Uh, yeah, well, but I, I see your point. Um, it makes sense to say that if, if you're talking about complete mediation in the, in the form of a syllogism, then it is more um, likely that the, that uh, complete mediation would then to, um, make a transition to immediacy, not to pure being, but to objectivity, which which uh, then begins with the immediacy of the object. Um, but I think the the upshot is the same. It would be a it would present a problem to Hegel's attempt to close his system in the syllogisms. Ah, okay, okay, good. Okay, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for everyone for coming and for your questions. And I look forward to seeing you all next week.